I definitely regret everything that I've done. I mean, those people did absolutely nothing to me. They did not deserve what I did to them. Uh, if I could take it back, I certainly would, but I can't. Possibly being executed uh, for those murders uh, is the only sense of justice that I can give them. Mark Douglas Burns, the so-called Clearfield rapist, serial killer, speaking out. What you're about to see is absolutely jaw-dropping. Incredible work being done by Adam Herbitz, investigative reporter from our affiliate KSTU, getting access and speaking with a serial killer and what he reveals, unbelievable. Take a listen. Hey, good afternoon, Mark. How are you doing? You hear me? I'm, w I'm well, Adam. And yourself? Do you get a lot of visitors? No, you're the only ones I've ever gotten. His name is Mark Douglas Burns, but for years when police were trying to figure out who he was, their cold case suspect was only known as the Clearfield Rapist. Adam, what a break in the case. We have a suspect now for the first time in almost 30 years. They were able to get this guy by looking at his DNA. Police say this man would often blindfold his victims and then forcibly rape them. The details are very, very disturbing. He lived an undercover life in Ogden as a truck driver. Before that, he beat death row, the gas chamber in North Carolina, for another rape he committed in 1974. In that case, he targeted a woman in a McDonald's restroom. All right, well, let's see where this goes then. These interviews you're about to see took place in February 2020. We're only releasing this series now because his confessions to Fox 13 were used as part of an ongoing investigation into new crimes that he had never been linked to before. I definitely regret everything that I've done. I mean, those people did absolutely nothing to me. They did not deserve what I did to them. Uh, if I could take it back, I certainly would, but I can't. Possibly being executed uh, for those murders uh, is the only sense of justice that I can give them. You were on death row in the past. Do you want to be on death row? I would rather be executed than spend the rest of my life in prison. Mark Burns is still facing a murder charge based on a case in Evanston, Wyoming, and has confessed to two other homicides, one in Oregon, and one in Arizona. All three of the homicides were totally by accident. None of them were planned. Uh, the one in Wyoming that they're, they're going to talk about was actually the only female victim. And that one was just a total mistake. My bad, total. She had nothing to do with it. I mean, she did nothing wrong. Totally my bad. It was just a, a situation that just went to sh instantly. And I chose the wrong way to handle it. Do you object to being called a serial killer? Uh, I don't know. I mean, if that's if if that's what it is, then that's what it is. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't. Uh, if that's what I am, then that's what I am. The Clearfield rapist will never have to face his murder victims. But earlier this year, he said it was uncomfortable to face the women he raped. I would ask the court. Show me, show me no mercy. He robbed me of my virginity, and safety, and sleep. Since that traumatic night, I have never again slept the night, ever. The bravest thing I ever did was continuing my life when I wanted to die. He gave me a life sentence, but he himself was free to live his life. His youngest victim was 11 years old, but she grew up strong. So this was just 19 months before I was taken. This is my mom and me. That's a great feeling never to have to look over my shoulder again. How did you pick your victims? Uh, I didn't pick them, just whoever left the door unlocked. Why? I don't know. Uh, I had a compulsion that uh, was irresistible. On the one hand, it was a, a hunger that was unquenchable, unsatisfiable. Uh, but then on the other hand, it fed me. Uh, it made me feel complete. You know, I never experienced love. I don't know, maybe maybe uh, these crimes were just some way of me actually being able to present my whole entire complete self as a human being to another person, whether they wanted it or not. And obviously, I'd rather be free than, than in spending the rest of my life in prison. But on the other hand, uh, I've had a great weight lifted off of me because of this now. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to provide some closure to my victims. 
uh, they certainly deserve it. Do you know how many women you have raped? I've got a pretty good idea. Uh, my memory's not as good as it used to be, but I'm not going to get into that now. Burns said he has not committed a crime since 2002, when his desire to fulfill his sick need started to fade. My brain does not function normally. I don't know if it's a chemical imbalance. Uh, maybe I've got an extra Y chromosome. Maybe it's just a loose wire. Up until recently, I've never experienced the feeling of guilt. I, I do feel regret. I do feel remorse. Uh, I do feel sorrow. These are, these are feelings I've never experienced before. I have become what I think is a responsible citizen. I'm a good neighbor. I'm a good friend. I'm a good employee. I think I'm basically a decent human being if it wasn't for the fact that I was also a monster. Unbelievable. Uh, let's bring in Adam Herbitz, who's the investigative reporter for KSTU, put all this together. First of all, Adam, amazing job, amazing work. Um, how did you get access to this serial killer? Why did he speak with you? That's a good question, Vinny. And honestly, I wish I had some sort of secret pill or some sort of secret method to gain access to people like that. The short answer really is we put in the request just like anybody else would. You heard him say he doesn't get a whole lot of visitors. I think he already knew who I was based on the fact that we were the first ones to report his arrest late last year. And he also had an idea that we were going to be looking into his past, his criminal history in which he was on death row back in the 1970s. Because of that, this ongoing, upcoming investigative report that we had planned, I think he realized it was in his best interest to, to talk to us and, and see if there was anything that might help him. All right, so you're interacting and speaking with someone who is a monster, an absolute monster. But if you didn't know all that information, if you're just having a conversation, just meeting this man, was there anything about him that struck you that was like, oh yeah, there's something really wrong with this guy? Not necessarily. I mean, the neighbors that we spoke to who lived next to him for years, they described him as incredibly polite. That's the same thing that we witnessed in our conversations with him. And he was just kind of a normal, run-of-the-mill guy living what seems to now be an undercover life in this small town of Ogden, Utah, just north of Salt Lake City. I, I was told that one of his neighbors even had a key to his apartment in which they would go in and check in whenever he would go on these long truck rides as part of his job as they long-haul truck driver. They said he was incredibly neat, very clean, and apparently he had no qualms with people going into his apartment and checking things out. What was the rest of his life like? Did, I mean, did he have friends? Did he do things for fun? Did he have a, a girlfriend, a wife, children, any of that? We know that he had at least some sort of dating life, although the way he described it to me is that his dating life wasn't very successful because he wasn't ever able to be fully honest with a woman. Obviously, he had a lot of secrets that he couldn't share with whoever he was dating. We also know that he has two children, two daughters that, to my understanding, are not uh, very involved in his life. He also has half-siblings who were able to kind of help solve this case. They were able to kind of take the DNA from some of the victims these are rape victims back from 1991 to 2001 and match that up to one of his half siblings. For whatever reason, that is the evidence that they were then able to get a search warrant, go through this man's trash can, find more DNA evidence and eventually link this all together. Yeah, amazing investigation. Um, but let's go back to this 1974 case. This, I'm scratching my head here. Uh, how did he... And he was on death row and somehow is off of death row and is free? How do you go from, okay, we're going to execute this guy to, all right, let him go? Yeah, Vinny, that's a question we've been trying to investigate now for more than a year. you got to remember, back in the 1970s, you were able to get the death penalty for rape. So this is a case in which he stuck a small piece of paper in the lock of a bathroom door at a McDonald's. He waited for an unsuspecting woman to walk in, and then as she struggled to lock it because of that piece of paper, he followed her in, committed his crime, and then walked out. At the time, he was a Marine. He was serving on a nearby military base. He was found guilty, he was convicted, and he was sentenced to death row. Now, at some point after his conviction, after his sentencing, lawyers decided and state legislators decided, look, maybe we should only reserve the death penalty 
for murderers. However, a key distinction to make here, regardless of how you feel about the death penalty, especially when it comes to crimes like this, he was not supposed to be let off death row based on the date he committed his crime. When they changed the law, it was only supposed to be for crimes committed after a certain date, and he did not meet the criteria to be let off. So when we asked him, why did they make some sort of exception for you? He didn't really have a clear answer. Obviously, he wasn't his own attorney at the time. So he said, as far as I can remember, it must have been some sort of deal between the prosecution and my defense attorney. He doesn't think there were a whole lot of people let off. But again, because this was so long ago, back in the 1970s, the judge is no longer alive. We couldn't ask him. His defense attorney is no longer alive, so we couldn't ask him. We did, however, find his defense attorney's son, who also happens to be an attorney practicing in North Carolina, we were able to forward some of those documents on his father's case, asking him, is there anything you can make of this? Can you figure out how your dad was able to get this convicted rapist off of death row? He couldn't even give us a good answer. Really bizarre. And, and we saw what it led to. Unbelievable. Well, Adam, we really appreciate your time tonight. Again, great work. Adam Herbitz, investigative reporter, KSTU. Thank you so much, sir.